Hello everybody, welcome to part four of our continued reading of the Apocalypse of Abraham. Once again, if you are new to this channel, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. However, you might want to start with part one because we're picking up this story in the middle of a lot of action happening. I am going to do a quick recap before we continue with our reading. But again, if this is your first time tuning into these readings, I would definitely suggest go back and listen to part one first. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. I had a lot of people asking me about the live readings on the Dark Outpost platform. So those live readings are from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the East Coast time of the United States, every Tuesday. And so the first hour from 1 to 2, we read through these missing or banned books. And then from 2 to 3, we read through or we're reading through right now To Train Up a Child by Michael and Debbie Pearl. Now with To Train Up a Child, I cannot recap that book on YouTube. That book is so horrendous and there's so much mental, psychological, and physical A-B-U-S-E, in my opinion, in that book, that I know that YouTube would probably not allow me to place a reading of that book on my channel. So if you are interested in hearing that book, you definitely want to be on the Dark Outpost platform for that. David is also on BitChute and Rumble. However, the wonderful thing with his personal platform is that there is no guidelines. It's him running his own platform, so we don't have to worry about watching what we say, anything like that, like we do on other platforms. And so that's kind of an awesome thing about his platform is that we can kind of speak. We don't have to speak in code, right? We can just speak very candidly about these topics. Now... A lot of people have asked, like, how can I find the backed logged videos on the Dark Outpost platform? So David is like a trooper when it comes to running his own show. And every day, Monday through fi Friday, his shows are multiple hours. It's very, very long shows. And he has multiple guests come on. Sometimes he has two or three guests in one show. So when you're looking through the menu on the analog past episodes, you might not see my name or see any reference to like the missing books of the Bible on those videos just because there were so many people that day. So if you're going back, I would look at the date because it's always going to be on a Tuesday, if that makes sense. Now again, with the Dark Outpost platform, yes, there is a small fee each month. I believe it's like $2 a month or like like $2.99 or $30 for the whole year. It's, it's very, very cheap for the Dark Outpost platform, and all of that money really just goes to maintaining the website. And also I know that he takes a portion of that money and donates it to a charity that he believes in um, that works with children who are going through some pretty horrific things. I think you know what I'm talking about. Kind of the main reason why most of us have channels at this point. So all of the money spent through the Dark Outpost really does go to really just keeping the program going and helping those who are in need. But again, if that's something you can't afford at the moment, he is on BitChute and Rumble. And then as always, I always recap the missing books on Wednesday on this channel. The only difference again is that we're not going through Michael and Debbie Pearl on this channel and when I read through the missing or banned books I only have my commentary. So in the live shows with David you can actually call in and join in in the conversation if that's something that you want to do. So that's also a perk of being able to tune into those live shows. So I hope that makes sense. If you're still confused with some stuff on the Dark Outpost, I can always send you David's email address so you can try to figure out what it is that you're still confused about and he can help you moving forward with that. So I also have a question that I want to ask you guys about a potential topic to cover on this channel because it's come up a lot with a lot of people, especially regarding these banned books. This is the topic of tarot cards. Now, I believe in my whole heart that tarot cards are not, they're not witchcraft, they're not sorcery, they're not what the Bible is talking about. 
now that we're able to read the Bible with 2020 vision, now that we're awake and we're up in that 5D realization, we know what they're talking about in the Bible when they talk about witchcraft and sorcery. It's not tarot cards. It's not astrology. But we are seeing in these banned books, especially with this Apocalypse of Abraham, that they intentionally took out a lot of these books so that we wouldn't understand the gravity of evil that has been happening from the Canaanites, we'll just say, all these years. And so this gave them, the bad guys in this movie, the bad guys, the ability to divide and conquer. And so they started this whole like gaslighting campaign for many, many, many years where anybody who considers themselves to be a Christian or someone who's on the side of God or the light, whatever you want to call that, if they were to do anything that involves spiritual divination or trying to communicate with God in their own way, that they were then evil. And so it started this divide and conquer where people, the Israelites, who we are, the good guys, started to point the fingers at each other, calling each other names and putting boundaries on the way that God can communicate with us so that we wouldn't look at what they were actually doing, if that makes sense. And this is a tactic, this is a war tactic that we've seen play out many, many times. It's kind of what's happening right now as well in our world. And as we start to wake up and move into this new wonderful world, this age of Aquarius, and again, I believe, and I know many of you believe that the quote unquote rapture that's spoken about is not bodies like physically lifting up off the planet, that's ridiculous. It's our consciousness waking up. The fact that we only use like 10% of our brain and now perhaps we're using more of our brain. We're gonna be using more of our DNA, right? So we're moving up vibrationally within our bodies. And so as we move into that new space, we're starting to really see a clear picture of, of what has happened to us and the mental gymnastics that they've put us through. And so moving forward, um, I was curious if you guys want me to perhaps do a deep dive into the history of tarot cards, of what I can find about tarot cards and how they started, the path they've been on, the road they've been on. You know, cards, and I've, I've had many, many readings with tarot cards in my life. I've never been afraid of tarot cards at all because they literally are just cards. They can't hurt you, they're cards. The person that is reading is the person that has the gift or the ability to understand the picture that's being put together by the cards. And like our friend Janine from Tarot by Janine, she does, I know she teaches people how to read. I think everybody can kind of be taught how to read. But there is a certain je ne sais quoi that most readers have that they're just born with, like an intuition where they're able to kind of put everything together, the puzzle that's being presented to them by the cards. Now, y'all know with our friend Janine, she's spoken many times about how the cards actually woke her up. Like the cards told her the truth about Mr. T, right? She said that many times that before this haul started, she was she watched CNN and, you know, was really listening to what they were saying and was not a fan of Mr. T and it wasn't until she started reading her cards on the situation and because she's such a good reader that she was able to kind of uh, course correct and realize and wake up because of the divination. Now, of course, there are always two sides to the spectrum. There are going to be people who are very sinister and wicked that can use the divination to their advantage, to the darkness. But here's the thing. If you've ever had a reading, a private reading with a reader, there's nothing that they're asking you to do. They're just telling you what they're reading off of the cards. So there's nothing that they're telling you you have to do. It's not like sorcery where you're casting spells. It's just looking through what's happening in your life and what your angels, what God wants you to understand, clarity, moving forward on a certain path. Whether that's this big path we're on right now together in a collective consciousness sort of way as we move into the age of Aquarius, or whether that's something very personal and private to your own life and your own karma, your own work. They're never telling you to do anything. And so in that way, there is no, no harm being done to anyone. Like we know the harm that's done 
in the bad guy side when they do their rituals y'all know what i'm talking about there's a lot of harm done you know there's always free will with tarot cards as well which free will is how the universe works of, of a personal choice which we've seen we're seeing in the apocalypse of abraham that there has to be a choice that's why god and the devil have like an agreement is because man because man fell from grace because man ate from the tree of knowledge and evil now there's consequences to that understanding where a man now has to feel pain and has to feel everything that it what it feels like to have a soul to have empathy and compassion and that love can sometimes be painful that's a consequence of understanding and so with that consequence of understanding you now have the responsibility to make your choice whose side are you going to be on lucifer's or god's very very clear in these books and the tarot cards never are going to like dictate that you do something bad there it's it's literally just about choices that you can make if it's a personal private reading about where certain chips lie you know warnings about taking one path versus another path it's all that kind of stuff and so there absolutely is nothing bad with them and as i've said many times you know saying that a christian can't read tarot cards because they're satanic is putting a boundary on god it's saying that god can't do that and that we as human beings make that decision on what god can and can't do and that's just not true god has no boundaries you know god is limitless god is self he god created himself and created everything right so I think most people are starting to become aware of that as we move forward. And so if you guys want me to do a deep dive into the history of tarot cards, I can put that on the list. And as soon as we get through some big uh, stories I'm working on in New Orleans, we're going to be finishing up the Mardi Gras, and then we're going to move into a huge section on voodoo. So um, as soon as that's done, I would be more than happy to do a deep dive on the history of tarot cards for you. And maybe I can talk to Janine and see if she can give me some insight as well to talk about that too. So just let me know um, down in the comment section below. Okay, <laughs> now that that housekeeping is over, let's go ahead and get started where we left off on chapter 26. Just a quick recap. Abraham, this is the story of him kind of waking up and becoming enlightened, his quote-unquote rapture for himself where he starts to understand. As one person wrote in the comments last week, and I loved it, God rewarded Abraham for having critical thinking skills because all of the first part of this book is Abraham basically scratching his head. He's critically looking at his father's religion and questioning it, the polytheistic religion. And he's starting to kind of work out that all these really strong and forceful elements of nature you know man versus nature nature always win but yet nature cannot win against itself in fact the opposite is true nature has to work with itself you know the water can drown out the earth but the sun can dry up the water the sun can give life but the moon can take the sun down so it's all these elements of nature working together and in a lot of faiths there are deities attached to the elements of nature. However, Abraham is saying, no, there is something beyond nature that is controlling nature, that has given nature its patterns, that has allowed us to have our life and the part of the nature of us that works with these powers. And so when he figures that out, Joel, who is one of the archangels, appears before Abraham and they go through a ritual of um, fasting and some sacrifices because it's the Old Testament and that's what they did back then, unfortunately. And then Abraham was at that point able to go up into the firmament. And we have, I've had a lot of comments about this as well. You know, if y'all remember, I think it was a couple months ago uh, when Tom Numbers and I were doing an episode with Janine, the last question that Tom asked the cards was, are we on a flat earth or are we on a round earth? Like what does what does our earth look like? And the cards basically, I'm paraphrasing, came back and said it is neither flat nor round and that's all you need to know for now. Like you're not ready to understand what your earth actually looks like or what the atmosphere actually looks like. You know, we have been so programmed, even those of us who are awake and understand have been so programmed to see things a certain way that 
to all of a sudden reveal the truth might be a little bit too traumatizing at the moment for all of us. You know, it's like sometimes ripping off the Band-Aid isn't good and we need to slowly, still for us who are awake, we need to kind of dip our toe into the baby pool so that we don't have a reverse reaction in our nervous system when we find out the truth. You know, we've talked about before that people, even Janine says that she's seen the two sons, like there's two sons now. You know, that where, where is that coming from? You know, what what is the firmament? What, like, you know, the big scientific organizations out there have never spoken about this before, but it's all over the Bible. And so when we leave Abraham off, he was in the seventh firmament of heaven with God. We learned that the fifth firmament is where the stars live, and that's basically astrology, and the stars have to obey Sorry, my dog's bark barking right now. I don't know if you guys can hear that. That the stars have to obey the order, and that is what then affects the earth. So again, astrology, as Melissa Red Pill the Nation has said, you know, astrology is our timeline. God gave us astrology for us to know what the time is. Now, the bad guys have tried to screw that up big time. We don't really know what year it is. None of us do. But we can look and know that on December 21st of 2020, when Saturn and Jupiter were in a certain alignment that technically ended the age of Pisces and began the age of Aquarius. Now we know that it takes a couple of years for the door to fully open into a new timeline, but that's a marker given to us by God through nature of the time so that we don't have to rely on the fictitious time given up to us by, we'll say the matrix for lack of a better word. So God kind of tells Abraham that this is the timeline, that he is going to allow this evil to be on the earth for a certain amount of time. And then when it's over, it's over. You have to make your choice. And that's also spoken about in Revelation as well. And then we come into the 1,000 years of peace. Yeah? We know that Abraham saw Adam and Eve, and basically they were giants. <laughs> as we said in the uh, Mardi Gras episode with Dionysus, all Nephilim were giants, but not all giants were Nephilim. Yeah, they're not, they weren't all evil. So we see that, and we know that, that there's people that believe Noah himself was actually a giant too. So who knows? You know, that, that's yet to be seen, but it's interesting. Um, we saw that basically from the very beginning of time, of this timeline with Adam and Eve, that's when kind of the end began for the bad guys, even though that's been like 6,000-ish years for us. That's not a lot of time for God. And so he showed um, Abraham things that were going on at the end of time, which are interesting interesting things that we spoke about last week with pertaining to children and what, what's happening to children. And that's where we left off. So now we're at chapter 26. Okay, so this brings us now to chapter 26, where we are going to be beginning today. This is titled, Why Sin is Permitted. So again, a big conversation in a lot of these missing or banned books. We saw this again in the book of Jubilee, like why the hell does this, basically this movie, as we call it, have to continue with Lucifer. And so we're going to talk about that now. We talked about it in the book of Jubilee, where God was like, you know, again, this is about free will and choosing between right and wrong. All right, so chapter 26. And I said, O eternal mighty one, wherefore hast thou established that it should be so, and then proclaim the knowledge thereof? And he said to me, Hear, Abraham, understand what I say to thee, and answer me as I question thee. Why did thy father Terah not listen to thy voice, and why did he not cease from the devilish idolatry until he perished and his whole household with him? So he's saying, like, listen, why did your father not come to me? Again, this is about free will, freedom of choice. And I said, O eternal mighty one, it was entirely because he did not choose to listen to me. But I, too, did not follow his works. Again, free will, free choice. And he said to me, Hear, Abraham, as the counsel of thy father is in him, and as thy counsel is in thee, so also is the counsel of my will in me ready for the coming days, before thou hast the knowledge of these, or canst see with thine eyes what is the future in them. How those of thy seed will be, look in the picture. So this is now chapter 27, a vision of the judgment and salvation. And again, this is talking about the vision of judgment and salvation at the end of time. So the end of the age of, of Pisces, like where we are today in our world. So this is super interesting. 
And I looked and saw, lo, the picture swayed, and from it emerged on its left side a heathen people. Again, the left side being the side of Lucifer, the right side being the side of God. And they pillaged those who were on the right side, men and women and children, some they slaughtered. Others they retained with themselves. Lo, I saw them run towards through four entrances, and they burnt the temple with fire, and the holy things that were therein they plundered. So we see that the left-handed side, the bad guys, are taking from the good guys, right? So in multitudes of way, they're picking up, picking off men, women, and children. We know all about that today. We know what that is. It starts with a T. I can't say it, but y'all know what that is, the T word. Um, I'll say it this way. Um, it's like here in Atlanta, in most cities, especially like cities like Los Angeles, we're known for really bad traffic with our cars. It's really bad. So I'll say it that way, the T word. He also says that they're going to retain some for themselves. And this to me can have two meanings. It could mean that there are some people that are picked off that aren't used in a ritual, if you know what I mean, but are used for other purposes. But it could also mean that some people who are born on the side of good are swayed to come to the side of bad that will make that choice. And the raw material also talks about is that, that as well, that for a negative-based entity to have a positive-based entity switch is super powerful for the negative. So um, that could also mean that too. Now we talk about the burning of the temple. This, of course, is referring to Moloch, who that's how they did their rituals with Moloch was the burning. So there we go. And we know, um, you know, one of our ex-first ladies mentioned that deity in one of her emails. So that's still being done. And I said, O eternal one, lo, the people that spring from me, whom thou hast accepted, the hordes of the heathens do plunder, and some they kill, while others they hold fast as aliens. And the temple they have burnt with fire, and the beautiful things therein they do rob and destroy. O eternal mighty one, if this be so, wherefore hast thou now lacerated my heart, and why should this be so? And he said to me, Hear, Abraham, what thou hast seen shall happen on account of thy seed who anger me by reason of the statue which thou sawest, and on account of the human slaughter and the picture through zeal in the temple. And as thou sawest, so shall it be. So it, it sounds like Abraham is having his kind of red pill, black pill moment where he's like really upset by what he's seeing. We've all been there. You know, think back to the time you realized what was going on in the world. You know, it's it's quite a shocking, gut-riching moment. And so that's what's happening with Abraham, this realization that these innocents, uh, especially children, are being used in such a way. And he's kind of like, why? Why can't you stop this? And basically, again, it came down to this agreement. And I said, O eternal mighty one, may the works of evil wrought in ungodliness now pass by, but show me rather those who fulfill the commandments, even the works of his righteousness, for thou canst do this. And he said to me, the time of righteousness, the time of righteousness meeteth them first through the holiness following from the kings and the righteous dealing rulers whom I at first created in order from such to rule among them. For from these issues, men who care for their interest as I have made known to thee and thou hast seen. So this brings us to chapter 28, How Long? And I answered and said, O mighty eternal one, hallowed by thy power, be favorable to my petition. For this thou brought me up here and show me, as thou hast brought me up to thy height. So make this known to me, thy beloved one, as much as I ask, whether what shall happen to them for long. And he showed me a multitude of his people and said to me on their account through four issues. So four issues, uh, Professor Box has a note here that this means basically four descendants or four generations. As thou sawest, shall I be provoked by them and in these my retribution for their deeds shall be accomplished. 
For in the fourth outgoing of a hundred years and one hour of the age, the same is a hundred years, as it shall be in misfortune among the heathen, but one hour in mercy and continually as among the heathens. So this now brings us to chapter 29. And I said, O eternal mighty one, how long a time is an hour of an age? And he said, Twelve years have I ordained for this ungodly age to rule among the heathens and in thy seed, and until the end of times it shall be as thou sawest. And do thou reckon and understand and look in this picture. So again, we're going to about to get into some of the stuff that happens at the end of this age. And I take uh, time, again, for my understanding as we talked about in the book of Jubilee, I don't know if we can truly understand what time of, of a time frame God is giving here because as far as like the years, because our time has been so screwed up for us. So again, this comes back to understanding astrology and being able to use astrology as the markers. All right. And I looked and I saw a man going out from the left side of the heathens, and there went men and women and children from his side of the heathens, many hosts, and worshipped him. And while I still looked, there came out from the right side many, and some insulted that man, while some struck him. Others, however, worshipped him. And I saw how these worshipped him, and how Azazel ran and worshipped him. And having kissed his face, he stood. He turned and stood behind him. And I said, O eternal mighty one, who is the man insulted and beaten? Who is worshipped by the heathens with Azazel? So this is super interesting because um, Box has a note here that this man there, that, that this referring to is Jesus. So he says, this man is clearly, clearly intended to be Jesus. His emerging from the left side of the heathen is curious. If the text is in order, it must be it must apparently refer to the emergence into the prominence of the early Christian church in the Gentile world. It clearly cannot refer to racial origins, for it is stated further on in the chapter that the man that sprang from Abraham's generation and God's people. But in the view of the definite statement below, this man from thy generation whom thy saw issue from my people, it is better to suppose that the text here is out of order and read from right to left and omit the heathen as an incorrect gloss. So he's saying basically that this, there we're seeing, Abraham is seeing Jesus because obviously Abraham lived long before Jesus came to the earth as a man. And there might be some mistranslations here is what he is saying. Because remember, guys, this original book was written in Hebrew. And then from Hebrew, it was translated to Greek. And then from Greek, it was translated to Old Syrian and Old Syrian into English. So Box is basically telling you like heads up, heads up, guys. There might be some misinformation. There might be some mistranslation here just because of the way things were written back then. So keep this with a grain of salt. But this is talking about Jesus. All right. And he answered and he said, Hear, Abraham, the man who thou sawest insulted and beaten and again worshipped, that is the relief granted by the heathen to the people who proceed from thee in the last days, in the twelfth hour of the age of ungodliness. But in the twelfth year of my final age, I will set up this man from thy generation, whom I saw issue from my people. This one all will follow, and such are called by me will join, even those who change their counsel. And if we think about the timeline, you know, for us in 2021, 2,000 years ago was a really, really long time, right? That's for human mind, that was a long time ago. But we are closer to G and closer to Jesus than Abraham was to Jesus' timeline, right? Timeline-wise, Abraham was further removed from Jesus than we are. And so if you're looking at time, in my opinion, if you're looking at time from God's point of view, seeing the coming of Jesus, the promised Messiah, for Abraham to see that and not know who he is, it's showing the beginning of the end for the Luciferians in a lot of ways. I hope that makes sense. All right. And those whom thou sawest emerge from the left side of the picture, what meaning is this? There shall be a many from the heathen who set their hopes upon him. And as for those whom thou sawest from thy seed on the right side, some insulting and striking others worshiping him, many of them shall be offended at him. He, however, is testing those who have worshiped him of thy seed in the twelfth hour of the inn with a view of the shortening of the age of ungodliness. Now remember again, as we spoke about a couple episodes back, we in the book of John, you see God, uh, Jesus referring to this, that Abraham saw him. 
to the this apocalypse of Abraham. So this was referenced. This book was actually referenced by Jesus in the Bible. Interesting, isn't that? Because in the the church wants to tell us that this book is heretical. But how is it heretical if Jesus was referencing it as if it was legitimate? All right. Before the age of righteousness beginneth to grow, my judgment shall come upon the lawless heathens through the people of thy seed, who have been separated for me. In those days I will bring upon all creatures of the earth in ten plagues, through misfortune and disease, inciting of the grief of their soul. Thus much will I bring upon the generations of man that be upon it on account of the provocation and the corruption of its creatures, whereby they provoke me. And then shall righteous men of thy seed be left in the number which kept secret by me hasten in the glory of my name to the place prepared beforehand for them, which thou sawest devastated in the picture, and they, sh and they shall live and be established through sacrifices and gifts of righteousness and truth in the age of righteousness, and shall rejoice in me continually, and they shall destroy those who have destroyed them, and shall insult those who have insulted them. And of those who defamed them, they shall spit in the face, scorned by me, while they, the righteous, shall behold me full of joy, rejoicing with my people, and receiving those who return to me in repentance. See, Abraham, what thou hast seen, and hear what thou hast heard, and take full knowledge what thou hast come to know. Go to thy heritage, and lo, I am with you forever. This brings us to chapter 30. The punishment of the heathen and the ingathering of Israel. And while he was still speaking, I found myself upon the earth. And I said, O eternal mighty one, I am no longer in the glory which I was while on high. What my soul longed to understand in my heart I do not understand. So this is interesting. I'm just going to read here a note that Bach has referring to what we just read. He writes, the number of the elect righteous is predetermined. This idea recurs in more than one form in the apocalyptic. Here apparently what is meant is that the number of the elect righteous who shall survive the Masonic woes has been fixed beforehand and is secret known only to God. These living righteous shall enjoy the blessed of a new age upon the renovated earth Nothing is said about the resurrection of the righteous dead to share in this felicity in chapter 31, the latter and joy of blessed existed in the heavenly paradise. Our book apparently knows nothing of a resurrection. On the other hand, it is the number of the righteous dead and martyrs. So back in Revelation, it's the number of the righteous dead and martyrs that is predetermined. Another application of the same idea is that to the whole number of mankind who are to be born, which is predetermined. So here's the thing, and this is just my opinion of this. You know, Box was translating this and trying to put logic to this word. And as I, as I said in the first episode, I do think from my reading of Box's studies, it appears to me that he did believe that this was a legitimate text. You know, he gives a lot of like points as to both sides. As a good scholarly academic man, he gave both sides for the viewer, for the reader to be able to make their own decision. But it did appear to me that he did believe this was legitimate. So we have to understand when we're reading some of his uh, notes on this is that this was again translated in 1918 over a hundred years ago and even for us for most of our lives we thought that the apocalypse the end of time would be this like gruesome awful experience for all of us in fact i think that the church gets a kick out of scaring us you know like fear you know fear p-o-r-n if you know what I'm saying, like it creates people's vulnerabilities and makes them depend upon these organizations more for security and safety. And as we know from Melissa Red Pill, the nation and Mickey Klon and all these other great uh, people out there who are researching this stuff, that's just simply not true. Uh, Revelation is probably one of the best books in the whole canonized Bible. It's a book of good news for us. It's talking about the end of a time. And we know that a lot of the weird stuff that is spoken about in Revelation is ast actually astrological. It's what's happening in the stars, not necessarily physically and literally on Earth. And when it talks about the elected righteous is predetermined, this is my 
interpretation of that. If we look back in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, and a lot of these other missing or quote-unquote heretical books, Jesus himself does speak about reincarnation. And I say this a lot, like I think we forget as Westerners that Jesus was not Western. He didn't come from the Western world. He wasn't from Detroit. He wasn't from Copenhagen. He wasn't from France. He was from the Middle East. He was Eastern. And so he had Eastern knowledge. And this idea of reincarnation, of living again, was a, is a very Eastern idea. It's, it's big in a lot of the old uh, Eastern texts. And I actually do believe we live multiple lives. Again, God isn't God is limitless. God doesn't have boundaries. He can do whatever he wants. He can send you back if he wants to send you back. If he feels like you need to be sent back to experience human life again, God is also merciful and graceful. And so when it comes to our own free will, if we're born in a situation in a life where we're not able to make good decisions because of forces in our lives, then who's to say he's not going to send you back again to repeat a life in order to make better decisions. It's kind of like when kids have to repeat a grade in school. You know, it's it, God is not some vengeful, awful force that's just, I mean, no, that's, that's, that's what the devil does. That's not what God does. God is merciful and loving and, and awe-inspiring. And who are we to say? Who are we to say what God decides to do with our souls? And so what I believe is that the number of elect righteous that is predetermined are people walking in our world right now. We call them perhaps maybe the Alliance or the White Hats, maybe even some truthers out there that are in our community who were appointed by God to be here at this time to help people wake up, to help people understand the glory of God. That is what I get from that. The number of elected righteousness is predetermined. There are people, I believe a lot of you listening right now, made an agreement with God that you would come back at this time to help humanity in this final battle. In one of the other philosophies we've looked at, it talked about that the disciples, the apostles, would all be back at this time. And I know on the Dark Outpost, we spoke about it a long time ago with Archbishop Vigano, who wrote beautiful letters back in 2020 to Mr. T. And we know Paul was a letter writer. Now, I'm not saying that Archbishop Vigano was Paul, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were the same soul. So that's what I get from that. That's what I get. Now, he is saying, too, that they don't understand at this point, not they, God does, but Abraham, who's writing this book, does not understand what a resurrection is. Again, Jesus has not come yet. He doesn't know about this idea of being resurrected, being re, you know, basically brought back from the dead. And for those of you that follow uh, Jason, and I'll, I'll, instead of saying his last name, I'll say 16 plus 1, he has spoken about the resurrection, that people will be resurrected after everything flips. And so you kind of have to take Box's notes here with a bit of a grain of salt because he is living in a time where we were not in the Great Awakening as we are now. So we're able to view this information with a different light or in a different light. And who's to say if Bach wasn't here today, he would probably maybe have different notes, right? So I just wanted to point that out. It's very interesting. But it's interesting to see kind of where we've come from as Christians or as God-fearing people to where we are now and how our, our understanding has totally shifted. All right, so let me reread that again, the beginning of chapter 30. But while he was speaking, I found myself upon the earth. And I said, O eternal mighty one, I am no longer in the glory in which I was while on high. And what my soul longed to understand in my heart, I do not understand. I think that's uh, very reminiscent of a lot of us. Like your gut kind of gets it, but your heart doesn't. It's like this this constant battle between your psyche and, and your soul and your brain, if that makes sense. And he said to me, what is desired in thine heart? And I will tell thee, because thou hast sought to see the ten plagues which I have prepared for the heathens. And I have prepared beforehand at the passing over of the twelfth hour of the earth. Hear what I divulge to thee, so it shall come to pass. The first is pain of great distress. The second, conflagration of many cities. The third, destruction and pestilence of animals. 
The fourth, hunger of the whole world of and and of its people. The fifth, by destruction among its rulers. Destruction by earthquake. And the sword. The sixth, multiplications of hail and snow. The seventh, the wild beast will be in their grave. And the eighth, hunger and pestilence will alternate with the destruction. The ninth, punishable by the sword and flight and distress. And the tenth, under and voices and destructive earthquake. Now, a lot of people have um, debated what all this means, but some people believe that all these plagues were going to be played out within like the 6,000 years. We were going to start to see this, like we see famine and, you know, natural disasters. And of course, now we know that they can control nat natural disasters. We've seen a lot of war breaking out and really stupid stuff. So, you know, I don't know what my opinion is on that yet. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but I wanted to point that out for you guys. All right. Oh, look, guys, this brings us to chapter 31, and I'm looking at it, and this is kind of exciting. And then I will sound the trumpet out of the air and will send mine elected one. Dun, 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 dun. Having in him all my power, one measure, and this one shall summon my despised people from the nations. And I will burn with fire those who have insulted them and who have ruled among them in this age. And I will give those who have covered me with mockery to scorn of the coming age. That I, And I have prepared them to be food for the fire of Hades and for the ceaseless flight to go fro through the air in the underworld beneath the earth. And the body filled with worms, for on them they shall see the righteousness of the Creator. Those namely who have chosen to do my will and those who have openly kept my commandments and they shall rejoice with joy over the downfall of men who still remain, who have followed the idols and their murders. Whoa, who have followed the idols and their M word. I'm not going to say that again. Hopefully YouTube didn't pick that up, but we know what that means. For they shall putrefy in the body of the evil worm Azazel and be burnt with the fire of Azazel's tongue. For I hope that they would come to me and not have loved and praised the strange God, and not have had adhered to him for whom they were not allotted. But instead they have forsaken the mighty Lord. Interesting, guys. The trumpet. What do y'all think of that? And he will have the power to kick, to take the nations down, basically. What do we call that now? What did Mr. T call that? The deep, S-T-A-T-E, as in dirty politics? It's pretty, pretty cool, isn't it? It's basically like what's happening. We're reading it from this text. Okay, so this brings us to the conclusion, actually. So chapter 32, Therefore hear, O Abraham, and see, lo, thy seventh generation shall go with thee, and they shall go out into a strange land, and they shall enslave them, and evil re-enter them, as it were an hour of an age of ungodliness, with a nation whom they shall serve, I will judge." So that kind of ends on a very uh, kind of happy note. You know, we know what he's talking about. That we have, and Melissa Redpill, the nation, said this um, quite eloquently in our show with David Zublick, that um, if you look at all these flags around the world, that the Israelites, the nations of Israel or Jacob, weren't, were all of different races. He had four wives who were of different races. And so just because you're a Gentile, if you have blonde hair, blue eyes, doesn't mean you're not heretically an Israelite, heretically of the tribe of Israel. However, with that being said, we do know that Jesus said that the Israelites wouldn't just be Hebrew people, that the Gentiles would be massively among his people. And back in that time with Jesus, that was, that was like crazy talk because they were dealing with the Roman Empire. And of course, it was true because a lot of Gentiles, anybody who is not of Jewish descent is Gentile. I'm a Gentile. You might be a Gentile. Is among the nation of the God of Abraham. And so that just kind of makes my heart warm. That was awesome. We're, I mean, literally everything in that book we're seeing play out right now. And so it, it definitely makes sense why they would have banned this book and tried to, to hide it. Again, those who have nothing to hide, hide nothing. They had a lot to hide. So anyway, that concluded that. Next week, we will be starting the book of the Tobit. I hope I'm saying that right, but we'll get into that next week with the history of that book. And 
we'll start to learn about all the different angels and stuff that has been censored out of our own Christian churches that we should know and have a foundation of knowing before we carry on in some of these other works. Let me know what y'all thought about this book down in the comment section below. Again, thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase our opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. Thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you all, and I will talk to all of you soon. Bye. Let me show.